Thank you for joining Prospecting today. And we are so blessed today because we got invited into Mike Ferry's <laughs> studio. And thank you. you're going to spend some time talking to us and our viewers. And I really thank you for taking the time for us. No, it's my pleasure 100%. And we're glad that you're watching and hopefully learning. Wonderful. Well, I Good. just wanted to start with, you are the legend. You are the king of <laughs> prospecting. How did you get there? I, I, I don't think I ever got there. I think I'm getting there. Okay, because I don't think it's something that you start and stop. I think it's something you do in sales for life. So I've always said that if, if you're ever going to be a good salesperson, you have to have people to talk to. So I've, I've just spent my life either learning or studying or understanding communications, talking to people, getting them engaged, getting them engaged in the product or service. So real estate people have to talk to people. So I, I, I don't think I have to smile when you say legend because that always refers to the fact that I'm old. <laughs> and I'm old. That's the best part about it. But it, what's good about it is whether you're young or old, if you talk to people, which is prospecting, you win. Right. And we're going to get to that <clears throat> later on in the interview because you've seen so much in the real estate industry. And I want you to teach like the up and comers, like sure. kind of they're grappling with some things today that you probably saw 20, 30 years ago. So we'll get to that. But first, I want to know what got you into this industry? Um. It was really very simple. I worked for a man named Earl Nightingale out of Chicago, which as many people would know that name that are your viewers. And uh, one of my jobs was to sell his motivational tapes to businesses in Southern California. <clears throat> and as a result, I would call on real estate companies because they have sales force. So I was intrigued all the time. Prior to doing that, um, in college, I got hired by a title insurance company to be a delivery boy. Mm -hmm. And I was delivering and picking up documents from real estate companies in Southern California every day. And I was always excited about talking to them and I was enthusiastic. So it was easy for me to understand what they were trying to accomplish and do. So it started in the title business and then Earl Nightingale had me selling our products to real estate individuals. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually feel like I've never done anything but real estate. Oh, that's my life. wonderful. Now, yeah. you're a coach in this industry, and, and we're going to talk yes. a little bit later about how a lot of people call themselves a coach. Correct. Do you consider yourself a controversial coach? No, I consider myself a common sense coach. I like that. Which is controversial. Okay, let's okay. talk about that. Um, you know, our industry, I always say, um, Kimberly, the industry is so unique and so wonderful and so screwed up. Okay. Um, and I say screwed up not to be derogatory, but the fact that there's 150 different philosophies being taught on how to sell real estate. That does not happen at IBM. That does not happen, happen at Apple Computer. There is a system in effect for an organization to follow to sell the product they have. Real estate's not like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as a result of you take a look at that very thought that you just brought up, I believe that there is a specific thing an agent should do to generate business. It's controversial because our industry says there's thousands of ways to generate business. Right. And there is. However, most of them don't generate enough business for an agent to make a living. Mm -hmm. So I'm very specific. I'll say to people, Kimberly, if you're new to real estate and you want to make this much money, do those activities. But if you want to make this much money, you have to do those activities plus a lot more. And those are the hard part of real estate. So common sense says if you talk to enough people, you're going to win no matter. If you ask 100 people a day, do you want to sell your home? Somebody's going to say yes. Right. Okay, you can't lose the game. But you have to put up with 99 people that say no. So common sense says I have to be told no to be told yes. Mm -hmm. But that's considered controversial because the agents who are non-salespeople when they join our business, mm -hmm. they don't understand the process that goes through learning how to sell. And brokers are afraid to teach them how to sell because if they teach them, they might get mad and quit. So we're at this constant standoff of uncommon sense in real estate when what I'm teaching is common sense. That's very interesting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But I want to talk about shift a little bit into prospecting. Sure. How is it changing or is it changing? Well, there's layers being added all the time. Okay, Social media can be a method of prospecting, Okay, um, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or tweeting or whatever you choose to use. As long as you're exposing your persona to people, that would be considered prospecting. Um, there's aggressive and there's passive. 
aggressive is face-to-face -face on the phone, talking to people, asking questions about what they're trying to accomplish with real estate. Passive is dancing around the issue to, so they'd be hopefully like you. And if they ever decide to sell, they would choose you versus somebody else. So today, branding and marketing, which has been around forever. I mean, Coca-Cola has been branding themselves for a hundred years. Um, it's new to real estate, but our industry is a little behind in most cases. So if you really take a look at the business today, yes, there's new layers being added, but the people that are most successful are the ones that are doing what you and I would call real prospecting, where you're in conversations with people. Mm -hmm. Social media is great. Facebook is great. We have a Facebook page in my company. I have a LinkedIn account. I have 30,000 connections. And so far in eight years, I think I've made zero off that. And yet they asked me to post things and there, we have a lot of views. And well, I would rather be sitting talking to you about your needs for buying and selling real estate than posting something about the fact that I'm going to dinner later tonight and to a show. <laughs> Right. Okay. So it, it depends on what the purpose is behind the agents. What, what is the agent trying to accomplish will tell us which layer they're going to use. So you're saying putting out your lifestyle isn't necessarily going to help you sell a home. Well, if I put out my lifestyle, people will never buy a home from me because they think I make too much money. Oh, yeah. So you have to always look at the fact that the agent, if they're good, makes a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. You're from Salt Lake City. There's some incredibly successful agents. And if the public know how much money they made, they probably wouldn't give them business because they think they make too much money. Interesting. So there, there is, there's the lifestyle thought, which is the avoidance of conversation. And then there's the aggressive side, which is purposely talking to somebody about real estate. So at Prospecting Today, I want to convey to people that I hear a lot that they're nervous that when they think prospecting, they're like, oh, that's cold calling. <laughs> I want them to understand that prospecting is so much more than just cold calling. Of course, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we, we would say to any agent, and we hope that there's thousands viewing what you're doing, because what you're doing is obviously very important for our industry. Watch past clients. They all have past clients, and if not, they're going to have them. Centers of influence, spheres of influence. Obviously, people like a for sale by owner who are trying to sell and compete with an agent. An expired listing, which means they had it listed and it didn't sell. Somebody needs to help them. Um, talking to the neighbors around a listing you take, talking to the neighbors about a sale that you make. There's dozens of ways that are very, what I call direct prospecting. Mm -hmm. And there's dozens that are non-confrontational. You get no rejection. So what we teach is, if you can learn to work and learn what to say, and you can accept the fact that rejection is part of what we do, because rejection is part of what we do. And here's the best example. I can do a seminar with a thousand people for three days. 20% of them are lifetime clients of Mike Ferry. That's, that's fun. 20% would never do one thing I say. So let me show you how much I'm concerned about that. Not. <laughs> Because they're yeah. never going to do it anyhow. Right. And then there's about 60% in the middle that are looking at all the different speakers and trainers and coaches trying to decide what to do. So it, you have to identify what you're trying to accomplish to identify what you have to do. Yeah. And if you can identify what you want to accomplish, then people like myself can hopefully help you do that if you want to. Well, and I think you've really built a very successful empire on, it's about prospecting. You have to prospect yes, yes. to be successful. So talk to me a little bit about your prospecting clinics. Well, the prospecting clinics, we started actually 25 years ago by mistake. Um, in Newport, by mistake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, it was see, yeah. in Newport Beach, California. We had our headquarters, which is where I lived. And we had agents that would call me and say, nobody in my office prospects. I'd say, yeah, that's normal. You know, there's 100 agents and two know how to work. And those two do most of the business, which is a typical real estate company. So I said to a bunch of one time, well, you know what? I'll do this. On Saturday, we have, we have 40 salespeople in my company. We have 40 sales booths. On Saturday, we're not working. If you want to come and use my space, a bunch of you get together and prospect. And that's how it started. And for probably about three years, we'd open up the office every Saturday morning and 10, 12, 20, 30, 50 people would come in put their headsets on, bring their leads, and prospect out of our office. 
then it started wearing out my carpeting and running up my phone bills and my coffee bills. And finally I said, you know what, I, I'm gonna charge you for this. So I started charging a small fee. Well, today, um, gosh, we do six to seven two-day prospecting clinics per month here in our Las Vegas headquarters. Oh, wow. We have 40 people come in and we charge a fee and they are thrilled to pay it because they spend eight hours a day for two days being coached and trained and prospecting. And the average agent sets seven appointments in two days. Oh, wow. The average agent that you and I would know on the street mm -hmm. probably hasn't had seven appointments this year. And we're in August, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's become a big deal for us. And it's a big deal for our clients. We have people that come every month. We'll set seven to 10 to 12 appointments, go on them all month, come back the next month, send seven to 12 more appointments, come back every month and do it again. So our prospecting clinic becomes their lead generation clinic. That's so interesting to me that you say that. So what you're basically telling me is they won't do that in their own hometown. They they're, won't set themselves up to work like that hard as they work when they come in and do your prospecting clinic. Because they're in an environment that is prospecting oriented. Do you think that there's a takeaway? Do you think they go back to wherever they came from and create that same kind of environment so they can continue the same kind of a success? We hope so. But okay. see, so often, and... Uh, please, all of you, accept what I'm going to say is not being negative. Mm -hmm. A real estate office is designed for people to prospect, but if leadership doesn't coax them and create the environment, they don't do it. Gotcha. So many times, one of our agents will be the only person in the office prospecting every day from, say, 8 to noon. Mm -hmm. And then because they're the only one, they get criticized, they get condemned, they get complained about. And after a while, they go, it's not worth it. So then they go home and prospect. But, you know, because it's, it's easier because to put up with all the negativity, huh. which is common. So we create an environment that is exciting and fun. And you got 40 people, okay, coming in for two days. We at 7.30 do a 15 minute pump them up meeting. We do another one at 10.30. We do one right after lunch. We do one at 2.30. Then at 4.30, we have a wrap up meeting for the day. The group that was just in, there were 35 of them, set 137 qualified listing appointments in two days. That's awesome. And they come from all over the country. So you're telling me they're in brokerages or they're in working environments that are negative towards prospecting. Well, they've been negative towards Mike Ferry for 45 years, which the foundation of my business is prospecting. Wow. And I, I wish I could say I understood the psychology behind it, but I can't. But I also understand that that handful of wonderful brokers that I hope your clients work mm -hmm. for, that promote working, would understand that you can't succeed without talking to people. So, okay, now picture, Kim. I'm a real estate broker, and I say to you, as a new licensee who's never sold anything in their life, you're going to have to get on the phone and talk to people, by owners, spheres of influence, expired listings, and here's a script that you have to learn and read which will give you the confidence to do it. And you call 10 people and they hang up the phone and they slam the phone and, or you knock on doors and they say, don't ever call me back and don't come to my house. You get rejected and you don't have any experience in selling. Well, that rejection you take personally. Right. And you're maybe overcome with fear because of that experience, which is understandable. Well, the broker then says, how did it go? I hated it. I got rejected. I don't want to ever do it again. Now, the broker has a choice. Mm. Train and coax, help you learn how to deal with it, or go to the next one. And if he says, you have to do it, and you say, I don't want to, and you quit, now listen to this. Then the broker has to prospect and find a new agent. Mm. Gotcha. See, if leadership is not going to do what has to be done to get an agent to produce, how can they expect the agents to produce? Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm considered controversial. Because I will say those things publicly, but of course, at age 74, who cares? <laughs> you know, there well, has to be a point proof where Proof is we, in the pudding. Yeah, so. well, there has to be a point where we have to face the reality. You know? Yeah. So if I'm a brand new agent like you were touching on and I come to you for advice, what type of... First of all, we're going to get... Let, I was going to get into this later, but let's get into it now. Should I work on a team? Should I look to work on a team? What type of brokerage should I be attracted to? Well, the good news is um, 20 years ago, there were probably three models for of brokerage. Today, there's probably 12. Um, there's, you know, each, each model or operating system is different than the next. You know, there's the pyramid schemes, which 
are successful. There's the traditional high service brokerage firms like a Coldwell Bank or C21. Mm -hmm. um, there's the more modern, the EXP type of companies. Uh, there's the high, high profile compass type of company. I mean, there's so many models today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that depends on where you live as to what models will be available to you. I'm not a big fan of an agent going on a team to start because they're going to work with buyers only. Okay. The, the heartbeat of real estate is listings. Right. So that's really where the big money is, that's right? That's where all the money is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can work a little more or much more efficiently if you're well, a listing agent, right? Well, see, it goes back to this. If, if you have five listings and I represent five buyers, I work for you. Mm, gotcha. So a listing agent is the employer. The agents working with buyers are the employees. Mm -hmm. And the employer makes more money than the employee. Mm -hmm. Period. And they control the inventory. So therefore, you control my schedule, you control my life, you control my activity by having listings. But you can't get listings if you don't prospect. And you can get your mother's house yeah, right. or your sister's house. <laughs> right. But outside of that, you're done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the, the challenge for the new licensee is to have, like you have, seven or eight or nine questions about what they're trying to accomplish and sit down with a broker and see what the broker's response are to the questions how far they want to go with building their business and can that broker help you with that. Okay. I think every broker has in their heart the desire to help the agent, but I believe they don't always know how. That's interesting. Yeah. So what what would some of those questions be? Would it be, I need to see, are you pro-prospecting? Well, Do you have a prospecting clinic I can feel comfortable <laughs> in on a it, daily basis? In most cases, if they say, are you pro-Mike Ferry if, as the first question, you'll know all you need to know. Well, there you go. <laughs> because the industry is so divided on Mike Ferry. You know, I mean, okay. half the industry hates me, half the industry loves me. Mm -hmm. I take that back. It's probably 80% hates me, 20% love me. But the 20% that loves me makes most of the money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would start with simple questions like, do you advocate prospecting? What kind of prospecting do you advocate? How do I go about building a business? Okay, how, can you give me the scripts that I need to use if I'm talking to a buyer or seller so I can sound intelligent? Um, can you help me learn how to negotiate a contract? And see, those kind of questions, if a broker can't answer or hesitates, you shake their hand and you go to the next one. Very because good there's advice. brokers in every town that, that can answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard from people that you are really big on telling them to upgrade your lifestyle. Yes. Upgrade your car, upgrade where, upgrade where you live, upgrade everything about your lifestyle. Do you ever run into agents that maybe have followed that advice before the money starts coming in? They follow it first? Yeah, follow the advice before the money has come in. And then what does that look like? Not good. No, no. <laughs> it's never so good. I just want to get your thought process on well, that. The reason I've talked for 15 years about upgrading is because, you know, you're coming from a real job, mm -hmm. okay? You came from the news industry and you were very successful for, what, 20 years. And you had a nice lifestyle and you made good money. And now you come into real estate with this carrot in front of you that could really help you make a lot of money. Well, the biggest problem people have in life, not real estate, is complacency. We get comfortable with what we have. And that comfort level in real estate, I mean, picture, Kim, I mean, you're in Salt Lake City and you sell a home for three or four hundred thousand dollars to a buyer and you make seven or eight thousand dollar commission and you came from a job making sixty thousand a year, which is five thousand a month, and now you make seven or eight thousand for one transaction, then you do two the next month and you make fourteen thousand. The hardest part of real estate is not being complacent and going back to your roots or your lifestyle of the past. So I tell people if you're gonna succeed, you gotta upgrade. Mm -hmm. how you think, what you say, your image, your style, your skills. Everything about you has to be upgraded to keep you moving forward in your business. See, So it's more a mindset you're trying to create. Oh, huge mindset. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I've studied successful business people all my life because I've always wanted to be a successful business person. And, you know, Jack Welch had a very simple policy. If you had one of his 278 corporations in GE that he operated, and you were not number one or number two in your market with your product. Either you became number one or number two, or you were fired. Mm. So you better upgrade how you operate your company. Um, Steve Jobs was the maverick 
for a long time because he kept challenging everybody to make the product better. And the better you make the product, the more people want it. So they, they were, they've never been satisfied with an iPhone. That's why there's an iPhone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. <laughs> right, no, yes, right. it's a profit motive, and it, but they keep improving the product. So I keep saying, if, if you and I can help through what you do, these agents improve the quality of their skill, they can then upgrade their life. Now, the question is- When the upgrades get, happen. <laughs> well, when do, are they happening before they get the income? Right. And I think that's the root of the question. Right. So we try to help them understand. You know, we, we tell an agent, all right, you're going to get a $7,000 commission check. 20% has to go into account A for taxes. 20% um, into account B for your future, whether it be savings or investments. 30% has to go into your business account to pay your business expenses. And then the balance goes into what you can live with. But if they take the check and put it in the bank account and say, hey, I got $7,000, honey, let's go live. Well, what if they don't get the next one for 90 days? Right. Or what if they've gone and leased a new car mm -hmm. and the payment is 750 bucks a month? We, we don't advocate that at all. You know, you have, to, you have to upgrade, but you have to upgrade the mental side to accomplish it, to make it work. Yeah, so start mental until the checks really start coming That's in. That's right. Okay. And if you do your job, the checks will come. Mm -hmm. Okay, no question. Are you familiar with the California Regional Multiple Listing Service and yes. that that yes. big kind of brouhaha out there about don't don't prospect to expireds if you find the information on our listing service? Yes. What are your thoughts on that? I've, I've looked at it very carefully. I've read all the reports. I. I don't know the attorney representing CAR that has really advocated that, and it'll be tied up in the courts for a long time. And quite honestly, um, Kim, there's always going to be those kind of brouhaha's in our industry because the size. I mean, if you think about the fact, let's say on a year like 2019, let's just say we have 5.2 million real estate sales transactions take place. How many industries? have 5.2 million transactions, especially at the amount of money per transaction. I mean, if this is not the largest industry in the country, it's certainly one of the top two, okay? Mm -hmm. When you have, now 5.2 million is 10.4 million paychecks because there's a listing and a sales side. Right. So there's 10.4 million transactions. So let's say we do 5.2, which is 10.4, or we have a bad year and we have 4.5 million, which is still 9 million transactions. Whenever you have that much taking place, politics, law, etc., is going to get involved. <clears throat> and somebody's going to find something they don't like and create a brouhaha. Mm -hmm. My attitude is always the same. Let the politicians and let the regulators be politics and regulate. In the meantime, if you're doing your job legally, ethically, morally right, it doesn't matter what's going on over here. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of sellers that need your service. There's a lot of buyers that need what you have to do. Do your job and let your broker and your board of realtors worry about that. Okay. And I, and I really strongly advocate that all the time. Yeah. So keep prospecting. Keep doing your job. Mm -hmm. Keep prospecting every day. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, there's always lawsuits among this industry. And there's always somebody promoting another lawsuit of some type. <clears throat> it just goes with the terror. If, if there was two sales a year, nobody would care. Yeah. There, there's been some pushback in that. I wrote an article about it as well, because there's some agents that that side with these homeowners that feel like they've been harassed yes. by agents. Mm -hmm. Any any words for agents in terms of like how to properly go about prospecting expireds so that homeowners maybe don't feel like they're getting 100 calls before 8 a.m.? <laughs> Thank you, Mike Ferry. Right, right. Because <laughs> okay, we tell them to call before 8. Yeah. And the uh, question is why is because you call them before they go to work. Right, right. I mean, it's you know, it's, it goes back to the common sense. You call them at 11, they're at work. The challenge is knowing what to say. Give, okay, me, so, give me an okay, example okay, so, let me, so they let me, don't feel harassed. Okay, so watch this example. I'm going to say three words. Okay. And three words the first time, you're going to want to slap my face. The second time, you're going to give me a high five. And it's okay. the same three words. So now it's not what I say, it's how I say it. So watch, excuse the language. Watch this. Okay. Son of a bitch. 
or son of a bitch. <laughs> it's all with the facial expression. It's the same three words. <laughs> okay. So calling an expired, if you have a script that is creates conversation, gets them to open up and talk and communicate, and if they don't want to, where the script says, well, thank you, sorry for bothering you, you're going to have good communication. You're not going to get complaints. Okay. So everything goes down to a script. Okay. What is the script you're using with a for sale by owner, with an expired, with your past clients? Mm -hmm. Are you calling your past clients and doing a Facebook page script? How you been? Where you been going? Mm -hmm. How was your vacation? Or are you calling your past clients and saying, are you still enjoying your home? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about upgrading and moving? Mm -hmm. You ever thought about buying an investment property to add to your portfolio? See, so knowing what to say is what creates the response you get. I feel sorry for a lot of buy owners and expireds because they do get harassed. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's laws in different parts of the world that ban you from calling an expired. Canada, you can't call them on the phone. Hmm. Federal law. But you can go knock on their door. Right. <laughs> How stupid is that law? <laughs> okay. But welcome. Doesn't, to... It feels less invasive when they're right in my door. <laughs> yes, I hear you. So I always say it, everything goes down to knowing what to say and practicing a pro football team, basketball team, golfer, a college tennis player, everybody practices their skill so they can deliver it in a manner that is acceptable, mm -hmm. okay? And a great entertainer. And as a news correspondent on TV, you didn't just one day just go on TV. You had to prepare and you had to right. practice and you had to role play and right. they tested you and screen tested. Mm -hmm. And you, at one point you say, when does that end? When do I start? Right. Mm -hmm. Same thing for real estate. Yeah, very true. So let's shift gears a little bit. I have noticed you're not the only fairy in the game. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> There's two of you that are really big in the coaching space. Yes, um, actually you three. And your, three of you. Actually four. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, my son, Matt, has a coaching company in a totally different space, but also deals with realtors. And my son, Patrick, works for my son, Tom, as a coach. Okay. So it's, you know, it's it's the band of fairies. Yes, it is. You guys have overtaken the, the coaching industry. Is it a friendly competition? Well, I, for me, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure it always is for them um, because there's the normal. And for all of you that are fathers and mothers that have kids mm -hmm. that are in the same business, we're going to hopefully do everything we can to have our children succeed because mm -hmm. I want them to succeed. Okay. But at the same time, there's many times a competition when you have, for example, a strong mother or a strong father, mm -hmm. that the competition sometimes isn't as friendly. So let's put it this way. When, like when Tom started his company, mm -hmm. my daughter, Michelle, who works for us, said, Dad, it's going to be kind of hard to have Thanksgiving dinner with all of us at the table. Mm -hmm. I said, well, we're probably not all going to be at the table. Okay. Yeah. And we went through several years of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but today, Tom and I, we play golf. Well, he has two incredible boys that, you know, are wonderful grandchildren of mine, both in college now. Um, Matthew has four boys, um, one in two in college and two still in high school. Um, Patrick has two small children that are just unbelievable grandchildren. So I have to go way beyond the business and the competition. I have to go to the level of, the, they're my children and my grandchildren. So it's, it's tough because I'm a little competitive. Yeah. Okay. Well, you'd have to be, right? Yeah. You know, you, you watch. Um, I, I'm trying to think who said it along the lines of, of you know, if the if the faint will inherit the earth, what's going to happen to all of us tigers? Yeah. Okay. The tiger is going to win the battle. So I'm a tiger, and Tom's a tiger, Matt's a tiger, Pat's a tiger, but we do have some very interesting and fun conversations. We don't believe in the same thing. Mm hmm. That's that's the biggest difference. What I believe in, I think Matt and Tom and Pat have a basic belief, but they don't teach what I teach. Did you teach them everything you know? You brought them up. They learned everything about how you do the business. Mm -hmm. So you taught them everything you know. I tried. Okay. Yeah. And then where are the differences? Matt and Tom and Pat are very analytical. People that are highly analytical are not always fond of confrontation. Okay. Um, my personality is what they call a driver personality. Um, I confront because I think that's how you move things forward. So Matt and Tom and Pat always were concerned that I was so confrontational with an audience, which I am today. Mm -hmm. Watch, either you're going to do it or you're not. And if you're not, get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. Let me talk to the ones that are going to do it because why am I going to waste my time with you that are not? Right. Well, 
that that's very hard for somebody that doesn't like confrontation to accept. So I don't think it was ever as much as that they didn't like what I was trying to get an audience to do. My style was always challenging for them. And yet all three boys are very strong. Mm-hmm. And they're very personable and great presenters on the platform. All three of them do mm-hmm. a great job. Well, they grew up with it, right? They grew up with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm going to say something that real estate agents don't like. You have two choices. Take a path that leads to productivity or take the path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. Which one do most people take? Least resistance, of course. It's easier. In all things. So. I don't care if an audience likes me. I think Matt, Tom, and Pat, who are excellent on the stage, are very concerned about an audience liking them. And they're going to say what they have to say, as does almost every speaker, from Wayne Dyer to Brian Tracy to Tony Robbins to Earl Nightingale, Mm -hmm. which is going way back to the 50s, uh, to Bill Gove, one of the first real sales trainers in our industry, to Tommy Hopkins, who is great. They want an audience to like them. I want an audience to produce. Because if they produce, they'll come back and see me. Right. If they don't produce and they just feel good, why would they come back? Right. So I have clients that have been with me for 30, 40 years. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, that are, I had five people yesterday in this studio been with me all more than 25 years that all make millions of dollars a year as residential real estate agents. And you were telling me earlier, they never stop prospecting. Ever. Which is really the key. That's yeah. what we're trying to convey. Yeah. Um, when I look at... Tom's company versus yours, it looks like he's more into the glitz and glamour and the social media. Correct. And I'm high, kind of, t- high tech. High tech. And sure, technology can make your job easier potentially, but I wanted to get your thoughts. Social media and going a different route with real estate, is it just a distraction for agents or what are your thoughts on that? Well, if you look at the words, social, mm-hmm. not business. Mm-hmm. Okay, social media. You notice it's not titled sales media? It's not titled income media. It's not titled production media. Mm-hmm. It's titled. It's not titled profit media. It's titled social media. Social. Mm-hmm. Watch. I'm. I'm not the most social person, but I enjoy being with people. Right. Um, my beautiful wife Sabrina, who you have met, is much more social than I am. Um, Tom is wonderfully social by nature. He's got a wonderful personality, and he really displays it well. But my belief is that social media is good if I want my neighbors to know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And yet you can say, well, I'm going to advertise on social media through Facebook, which you can do, and you can make sales and take listings. Or you can take and call people and get a higher response. Mm -hmm. So would most people rather put something on social media and wait for a response, or would most people rather create a response? The answer is wait. And Tom, well, I I sent a message to Tom, and Tom, if you're watching it, I hope you do. Um, (laughs) It's the second time that I'll discuss this message. Tom sent me a wonderful message. He and I, several months ago, did a thing for Mm -hmm. the Hispanic Association of Realtors. And And it's really great. Everyone should watch it. It it really, it was so much fun. I I really, because we had not worked together on the stage for a long time. I think the time before that was with uh, Inman in New York City, um, back several years ago. And afterwards, Tom did something which every father wants to have happen by their son. Tom sent me a note and said, Dad, Okay, I'm turning 50 next year. And you've always said that you have to be 50 to be smart enough and mature enough to really do anything with your life, Mm -hmm. because that's my belief. And he said, so what advice would you give me? I love that. Yeah, I was was so proud, and I still am of Tom for that question. I don't think he liked my answer too much. I'm excited to hear the answer. Well, I gave him two answers, but the second one was the advice that I received when I was 30 years old from my three mentors, Earl Nightingale, Gunther Claus, and Michael Vance, Mm -hmm. okay? And I said, these three men, Tom, taught me that you had to create a system that is sustainable, usable, and productive that you can teach. So in 20, 30, 50 years, that system is still alive and breathing. Colonel Sanders, McDonald's, they have a system for producing something yeah. that is sustainable. Right. Um, Dale Carnegie mm-hmm. is a system. So I said, Tom, my concern is that he doesn't have a system. He takes all the wonderful things that are what I call the shiny nickels at the minute and presents them in an incredible fashion mm-hmm. because people are all excited. But I'm not sure that for any of them it's sustainable. Now, yes, 
there will always be a percentage that can sustain the shiny nickel. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I said that to Tom in, in, in my response. And he rolled back, and I, again, I hope Tom's watching. He rolled back, gee, Dad, I meant personally, not business. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I haven't responded on a personal level yet. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I've thought about it a lot. Yeah. Sustainability is what builds a business. Mm -hmm. What I teach is sustainable. Mm -hmm. Knowing what to say, knowing what to do, okay, having exact skills is sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Brady has a skill set like nobody has ever had in pro football as a quarterback. Mm -hmm. But that skill set will allow him to play way beyond what an average player can play. Magic Johnson as a basketball player, Michael Jordan, okay, a great baseball player. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Nadal as a tennis player. Mm -hmm. Okay, These are people that have a sustained skill set. Well, they have a skill set, but I think it's more. They have the system because yes. Tom has the skill set, Tom Brady, but he also has this like incredible diet that most people Everything. would never follow. Like no. it's a system he yes. does to prolong his career. His career. Yeah. He takes a knee far before anyone ever oh, gets yeah. to him. <laughs> I, He's got a system. Yeah. <laughs> I had a chance one time to fly many, many years ago. So this name will not bring up many good memories to people. But I sat next to O.J. Simpson on a flight to New York. Oh, that's interesting. And we had a great conversation. He's on Twitter now, by the way. Yes. Have you heard? <laughs> yes, I have. He's a local resident to our city of oh, Las okay. Vegas. And of course, big star at USC. And I'm a big USC fan. And a couple of the kids I played high school football with played with him at USC. So it was fun talking to him because he's, you know, forget all the things we've heard, a one-on-one -on -one conversation at that point was very interesting. I said to him, okay, I don't understand. Often you get the ball, you run, you go left to right, and just before they hit you, you step out of bounds when you could have gained three more yards. OJ said this. Yeah, I okay. said it to OJ. Oh, you said it to OJ. And oh, I okay. said, why? He said, well, yes, I could gain three more yards and possibly get hurt and in the next play not gain any yards. So I'd rather gain, th you know, give up three yards four or five times to have one time where I can break away for 50. Right, right. Well, the system that the coach had allowed him to have those breakaways because mm -hmm. a great runner only has to have one or two breakaways a game. Right. A great golfer only has to have one or two shots in a match. Mm-hmm. So the system is what we offer. And I'm always afraid with most of my competition, they don't have a system in effect that is sustainable. Mm -hmm. We have what is called the Mike Ferry sales system. Mm -hmm. Manage your time, prospect every day, work your database, always do aggressive lead follow-up, pre-qualify buyers and sellers, make a strong presentation, handle objections, close the sale, negotiate the contract, then start over. Yeah. That can be done. And in, don't deviate. And don't deviate. Yeah. And whether you are an artist painting, a great newscaster, okay, or a real estate trainer, if you teach a system that is sustainable, people will stay with you. Yeah, I like that, which leads us into our next segment because we want to talk coaching. And I hear a lot of um, people talking about coaching when in reality it feels more like cheerleading to me. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the difference. That's what, Brad, that's what Brad Inman said on stage with Tom and I. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see that one. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about golfing, when I think about like Tiger Woods, I'm sure he has, well, how could he not? An incredible coach that has perfected yes. that golf swing. Yes. So what would be the difference between an incredible coach that can teach that perfection versus a cheerleader who thinks no matter how he swings is amazing? Well, it's interesting. When Tom and I did an interview with Brad Inman in front of the Inman Conference in New York, um, Brad said something to start, which really was really kind of fun. He goes, to his audience, I don't believe in coaching. I don't believe in training. I don't believe in hype. I think it's a waste of time. And he kind of stretched it out. And then he said, what do you think, Tom? Well, Tom is so much fun. Mm -hmm. He jumps up and he's all excited and he's really attacking what Brad said. And I thought it was all well done. Mm -hmm. Okay, But in essence, Tom was doing exactly what Brad said, jumping yeah. up and down, cheerleading, running yeah. around, pumping people up. <laughs> well, motivation is great, but it's temporary. Mm -hmm. Skills learned are permanent. So after Tom talked for 10 minutes, he said to me, what do you think? Brad asked me, and I said to the audience, well, Brad, we have a difference of opinion, which is not common, uncommon for father and son. But the best example I can give you to not display what Tom did is to take you to a city 100 miles from here called Boston, Massachusetts, in a pro football team. Mm 
called the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. And I said, they have a coach who is as uninspiring, or maybe I should say, he's as inspiring as a nail, mm -hmm. Bill Belichick. Yeah. Stands on the sideline in a pair of baggy pants and a gray hoodie, and he has a playbook in his hand, and he tells people what to do, and they damn well better do it if they want to play. Okay. And he makes it very clear, you will do exactly what I say. And those players fought, do that. And they've won six world championships mm -hmm. following an uninspiring leader. So I'm the uninspiring real estate coach and Tom is the inspiring one. Mm -hmm. However, then I said to his audience, Bill Belichick has won six world championships. Mm -hmm. So I said, audience, if you want hype and motivation, go with Tom. You want to win a world championship? Come to dad. <laughs> <laughs> Tom leans over and says, dad. Yeah. I said, hey, Tom, you opened the door. I stepped in. Because what's the difference? The coaching is certain real methods, right? It's methodology, skills, and mindset mm -hmm. versus hype. Yeah. Okay. Tom, I mean, I love watching a Brian Tracy or a Tony Robbins. I love watching these guys. God, they're so, they get people so excited. Yeah. They Get him up into a frenzy. Oh my almost. gosh, yeah. it's almost a frenzy. And yeah. Tom is really good. Matt is really good at it because Matt can really get to their head. I'm not that good at that. I'm good at helping you understand the process and what to say and what to do to get to the end result. Mm -hmm. That's sustainable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And that's the difference between, I think, the fluff and the hype and the real coaching. Um, if you watch the great golfers and tennis players, their coaches are not going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. No. Mm -mm. Never. Mm -mm. I've played in 75 professional golf tournaments as an amateur. Mm -hmm. And I've been sitting on the driving range with professional players from Tiger Woods and Arnold Palmer to Jim Furyk to the newest players because I've been right with them. And their coaches are never saying, come on, come on, come on, come on. Mm -hmm. They're saying, why did you do that? Okay, why are you deviating from what I'm teaching you? Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. Yeah, I like that. So what's the difference between coaching and training? <laughs> okay, you and I, you tell me you want to go into real estate and you want to be coached. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about your background, your experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you what the goals are, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I'm going to help you set a plan to get started. I'm going to moderate that plan with you, hold you accountable to it. Mm -hmm. um, so coaching is one-on-one. -on -one. You and I, mm -hmm. whether it be a phone or in person. Training is, I have a group of people that I'm trying to teach something to. So a school teacher is a trainer, okay? But when they're hired to do private lessons for a student, they become a coach. Mm -hmm. So the difference is a group. So I, you know, our company does 25 or 30 big events a year in the US. Those are training sessions. And as a result of that, we also attract some clients into coaching where we're working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So I, I challenge everybody out there that's involved in real estate, just because a broker or an agent puts behind their name coach doesn't mean they are. Right. They may be a great trainer, and I hope for your sake they are. Mm -hmm. But coaching is one-on-one. -on -one. So let's help people figure that out. How, what makes a good coach? What should they be looking for? I asked that question of Pat Riley. Okay, was the coach of the Lakers, won, I think, four or five world championships, then mm -hmm. coached New York mm -hmm. in Miami as, I think, president, part owner, won world championships. I said to Pat Raleigh one day, because he played on the championship teams for the Lakers as a player. And I said to Pat, how did you become a coach? Because mm -hmm. you were one of five great players on a great team. He said, well, the truth is I wasn't the best player. And I understood that, but I really understood what all the best players do. So it's easy then to become a coach. So either you have experience in real estate or sales, or you have such a deep understanding of it that you can relate that to what you're trying to accomplish would make mm -hmm. you a great coach. And instead of doing anything else, you ask a lot of questions, which creates a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm. So a great coach is going to challenge the individual. Okay. So I have 15 clients that I still coach today. And I will always be challenging them as to what they're doing. We'll start a call and I'll say, what happened last week? And did you do what I asked? Mm -hmm. if so there's accountability right off the bat. has to be accountability. Mm -hmm. So it's not a love-hate relationship and it's not a love relationship. And we're not flower children smoking dope and trying right. to feel good about life. We're trying to move your business forward. Right. That's what makes a great coach. Okay. So it's always results. 
Right. What makes a good agent? A person that will follow the advice of their coach. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay? Um, and, and a lot of these agents are natural born salespeople, which we know, and a lot of you are blessed with that skill. But if you're not a natural born salesperson, you're never going to be very productive. Now, remember too, Kim, longevity does create great salespeople. Mm -hmm. You've been in the business 20 years doing five, 10 deals a year. You've always done great follow-up with your clients, which is a form of prospecting, and your business has grown. Mm -hmm. Or you take what I do, and starting in year one, you succeed at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Now, you've coached many generations now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I shouldn't say many generations. Oh, no, no, a it's couple true. of generations. No, it's true. <laughs> I've, I've coached the parents, their children, and their grandchildren. I no. love that. Yeah. You should get a photo of that, like I know. four generations. Sure. <laughs> um, what's the difference? What are you noticing in this up and coming generation? First of all, I don't buy into baby boomers, millennials, generation X, generations. I, I never bought into that. Because, so you don't see different work ethics? Well, yes. It, 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 trends and tides change. You, you, know, you live at the beach, the tide is up, the tide is down. Mm -hmm. But, Kim, what I believe is. <clears throat> Every 10 years, we have a new set coming out of age 20. Yeah. Between 20 and 30 is the exploration point in your life. <laughs> in real estate? In anything. Okay. When we think about it, you know, you, you're coming out of high school or college and now you're out in the world. Right. Okay. Um, two of my grandsons, we do something kind of fun. On, uh, many times on a Saturday or Sunday, I'll try to get three or four of the grandsons in Newport Beach to have breakfast with me. Okay, and we do it quite a bit, and it's so much fun because they're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, mm -hmm. and they all say the same thing. Well, when I get out of high school, I want to take a couple months off and go to Europe. Is that new? <laughs> no. I think kids have been talking about yeah. that since 1930. Okay, right, that's true. Um, so my belief is that every generation starting at age 20 to 30 has to explore, and they're going to question, and the group above them, 30 to 40, are of course wrong. Mm -hmm. and don't have any common sense, and we're going to do something nobody's ever done before. So I don't, I'm not a believer in the millennials or the Generation X. I'm just saying the next group starting out is going to question what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. So how do we help them understand it, and is there anything they're doing that we should learn from them? Oh, I like that approach. Yeah. So you're, you're a constant student as well. All the time. Yeah. I, I'm probably a much better student than I am anything else. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people would disagree with that. <laughs> well, I study all the time. Yeah, that's you lovely. I, I try to read 200 books a year. I've done that for 50 years. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, so. That's fantastic. Um, it's because I wasn't very bright. I had to learn. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know about that. But <clears throat> what is it in the industry that agents just don't get today? Probably a combination of... Um, the skills required to be good. <clears throat> you mentioned Tom Brady. We talked about that. He has a skill set that is monitored and he's held accountable to and he's developing. Selling is a skill-based business. Mm -hmm. um, so I would ask your wonderful audience this question. Would you like to have a brain surgeon doing surgery on you that has your skill set as a salesperson? My skill set. As a salesperson. Yes. A brain surgeon? Yeah. No. No, because you would die. Right. Would you want an attorney with your skill set representing you in court? No. Mm -hmm. Do you want a pilot that is so programmed what to do that one out of every several million planes crash because of a pilot error? I want the most programmed, skilled person. Mm -hmm. Our family doctor, our pilot, because we have our own plane, our accounting, these people are highly skilled. That's what I pay for. That's what I want. Right. And I, and I think that's what the public wants. And that's the hardest part of real estate right there mm -hmm. is understanding that your productivity will increase as your skills become stronger. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you're seen as an expert and people want the expert, right? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want a poorly trained doctor. And I really don't want a poorly trained pilot. No, you defi no <laughs> definitely not. And you've seen the difference in Las Vegas and entertainers, those that are the highest skill. We just saw Lionel Richie. Oh, wow. Unbelievable, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, his his presence on the stage, it's almost hard to describe. His voice is not as good as it used to sure. be. It happens, okay? We saw Tony Bennett at age 91 recently. Oh, wow. The voice is magical, but he doesn't have the same ability on the stage because he's 91, mm -hmm. okay? But if you look at Lionel Richie, that's skill of performing. 
it's magical. I mean, we sat there in the front row, Subin and I, and one of our coaches, Gay Lee, mm-hmm. and our mouths were open because we, we, I mean, he's probably in his 70s. He's my oh, age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But see, I say to myself, wait a minute, I do that every day. Mm-hmm. I'm older physically, but I'm still stronger than I was. Yeah, I like that. Um, let's talk the market. Okay. What's going on with the market? You, because you've been doing this for so long, you've been through many different recessions <laughs> and yeah. you figured out you know, how to rise above them. How do you feel like the market's going today? We operate in five to seven year cycles. Okay, so we'll have five to seven years of a improving market. As with anything in life, there's always going to be an adjustment period. Some of those adjustments are longer than others, and some are not as severe as others. The worst one, of course, was 2006 to 2012. I mean, it was worldwide. Right, right. Okay, and I nobody likes to hear this, but I think it was cost 100 percent by real estate in the U.S. Mm-hmm. is the cause of the world depression. So if we accept the fact there's cycles from 2012 to 2018, we're going this way. Mm -hmm. All the markets that got hurt recovered, or in essence, we got back what we lost. Mm -hmm. That's six years. So if you really watch the market in most of the country, U.S., around mid-2018, started to slow down and dip a little bit. Mm -hmm. In 2019, the first three months of the year were horrific for real estate. It was terrible. 2019. Okay. Oh, this this year. Oh my gosh, the first part of the year was it was a disaster. Really? And there's a lot of valid reasons why it took place. And now it started to pick up again in April, May, and it's it recovered pretty well. But I think if we expect the fact that it's going to be a seasonal thing, meaning every five to six seasons, we're going to have an adjustment. So we're due now for an adjustment for the next six months to a year. But I tell real estate salespeople, why would you let the economy affect your production? Yeah. I mean, there's going to be 5 million sales in a bad market and 5.4 million in a good market. For goodness sakes, take advantage of the skills. Now, remember, in a bad market, half the agents quit. Right. So your chances for succeeding are better in a bad market than a good market because right, there's less you can competition. Pick up, yeah, you can pick up more business. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I'm one of the only guys that prays for a recession. Really? Just because it weeds out all the really bad real estate agents or good, the lazy ones? Well, all of our good agents succeed at a higher level. Yeah, I like that. So that's your your <laughs> answer for weathering the storm, right? One hundred percent. Because you've I, seen it. I was at the gym, uh-huh. and I went downstairs to shower, and one of my friends walked by and said, "Mike, how's the real estate market?" This was a couple of years ago. I said, "Well, it's still pretty tough right now. It's not that good." And the guy next to me said, "Oh, you must be an attorney because only attorneys like bad times," which oh. I thought was interesting. Yeah, because attorneys don't make money if everybody's following the law. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Because you think about recession-proof jobs, I never think of law. But that yeah. is interesting. And real estate is recession-proof if you're good. Talk about that. I think they want to hear those skills. And what I think I hear you saying is, don't stop what you're doing. Yes. Prospect, prospects, prospect. Yes. Continue to work your system. Yes. Don't let up, even if you're maybe not making as many sales as you were last year. You will pick up. That's right. Everything in life is cyclical. Uh How you feel, how you sleep, how you Mm -hmm. exercise, how you eat, um, your health, everything is cyclical. Your business is cyclical. But if you stay with your program, you're going to live a long life. And in real estate, that is just prolonging. Most careers are three to five years for real estate people. So our job is to prolong the career of a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. So we have prolonged the careers of tens of thousands of people. Okay, that might have been gone in five years that are now really active and it's year 20, 25, or 30. Just by following your system. Just by following the system. Knowing that you're going to have some waves on that. Have you ever surfed? No. Yeah, I grew up surfing. And, you know, you always want the big waves until they knock you off your board. Right. (laughs) Okay. And when your head's stuck in the sand underneath the water, you're not as happy. Yeah. But the thrill of victory is always better than that agony of defeat. Interesting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I like that. So I noticed that you're probably very familiar with the danger report, right? That yes. NAR put out in 2015, yeah. where they said that the number one threat to this industry was the incompetent agent. Yes. Do you think that's still the case today? I don't think it's ever changed. Okay. You know, Talk a little it, bit about the incompetent agent and how well, that harms the industry. In Italy, where we operate also, I think there's 45,000 agents in the country. Only half of them are licensed. You don't have to have a real estate license to be a real estate agent in Italy. Well, that does not lead to high levels of competence. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
um, in our industry, you take a test, you go to school, mm -hmm. and you take a test that's based on law, which has nothing to do with selling real estate. So we attract then a huge group of people that can pass a test that can tell you the square footage of an acre. How many buyers care? Okay, unless you have a farm. So until we change, okay, so here's maybe answer this way. Many years ago, I wrote a letter to the National Association of Realtors and I said to them, why not have a minimum standard that an agent has to do, for example, 10 deals a year to maintain their license? Mm -hmm. I said, then all the ones that are no good would leave and we would have a better industry, better representation of the public, higher levels of respect from the public back to the agent, and a higher profit margin for everybody. Well, they don't want to lose their dues. Well, that's right. exactly it. Right. It's a dues organization, right. and they are. Yeah. They want a million people paying dues instead of 200,000, they're making a lot of money. Right. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting balancing act. I don't think the agents are any more confident today than they were 20 years ago or in 2015. Mm -hmm. However, the ones that are competent are separating themselves at a rapid pace from the group. Mm -hmm. Okay. It just I mean, makes their job harder though, right? If they yeah. have to follow up an incompetent agent, All a screw up, yep. that happened along the we, way. We get four or five people per month, don't get mad out there, that join our coaching that comes from our competitors where they never did anything. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm happy they joined us. I'm sorry that it came from that circumstance. Because mm -hmm. I would like my competition to be better because it would force me to be better. Yeah. You know, well, there you go. <laughs> can't win a game if you're a loser. Well, or no, you can't win a game if you don't have any competition. That's right. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's true. So last market question. We have a, an upcoming presidential election. Yes. Do you think it's going to change the market in any way depending on who wins that election? I'm a diehard Republican. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I never talk about politics in seminars because it's taboo. Um I don't remember, I think it was Norman Vincent Peale said, you never talk about sex, politics, or religion. Right. I go, well, then what do you talk about? <laughs> okay. Kind of nothing limits. that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, nothing interesting at all. Yeah. Um, so I'm so far to the right, I'm coming up on the left. So that shows you how far to the right I am. So I am concerned as an individual and concerned as a business owner that if we don't reelect our existing political system, it will have an immediate effect on the stock market and probably could throw us into a pretty good recession. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's a business owner, which a real estate agent is, should be trying to protect the integrity of what's going on today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's face it, the left is pretty far out there today in terms of their views of mm -hmm. everything that mm -hmm. a Republican might do. So it's going to be it's going to be touch and go. I'm I'm concerned, but at age 74, I'm in a financial position where I don't have to be concerned. Yeah. But I'm concerned for my children and my grandchildren. Yeah. Of what's going to happen after the next election. So it very well could affect the market. Yes. In terms of how yeah. successful agents can be. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I hate to see the restriction of laws put in by the government on real estate and the activities of real estate people, unless there is a major problem that needs to be solved. And there doesn't seem to be, I mean, there's always going to be ethical problems in business. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be moral problems in business, but there's no ethical and moral problems that are so big the government has to change how our business operates. And I'm afraid that that could happen, gotcha. whether it be the commissions earned or the licensing laws and so forth. Like the so, latest lawsuit that's working yes, its way through. That's right. Any thoughts on that one? Lawsuits are- well, The commission-based one. Well, the lawsuits are designed to pay attorneys a lot of money. True. Okay. I played golf with a couple of fellows that- were part of the original group that filed the lawsuits representing the public against the tobacco industry 20-some mm -hmm. years ago. And these two guys were pretty happy. And I said, why are you so happy? You're involved in a big lawsuit. They said, we're going to make several billion dollars each. Mm. I said, well, that would make me happy too. Okay. Yeah. So, But that lawsuit took 20 years. So I, I'm, I'm always concerned, but I don't think it's going to have any effect on the people that are good at what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether the commission is fixed or unfixed, mm -hmm. stabilized or unstabilized, reduced from six to one, the mm -hmm. people that are good are going to still earn the money. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's shift gears to your legacy now. <laughs> 74, so you're in your mid-70s. You're still yes. very sharp and very passionate about what you do. Yes. How long do you think you'll continue coaching? Well, you know, it's funny. Two days ago, I had a person say to me, I'm thinking about joining a competitor's company, not yours, because of your age. 
And I never received that objection before. And I wrote back, I said, here's what I'm going to do. If you join our coaching, I will commit to you today that I'm going to retire for sure at age 90. (laughs) So you have 16 years to work with us. Yeah. And he wrote back the next day, I just signed the contract. Well, health permitting and the fact that I still am mentally capable, I don't see any reason to stop. I, I told my boys years ago that I wanted to stop at 70, but when I got to 70, it was just beginning to have so much fun. Mm-hmm. So Tom's mother-in-law is just wonderful lady named Lola, mm-hmm. and just a wonderful gal. She's 92, okay, and still real strong. So I said to her at dinner, we were having dinner several weeks ago, I said, Lola, what were the 70s like? She goes, they were hot. I said, I like that. How about the 80s? Not quite as good. How about the 90s? It's tough. So I said, okay, I can do this till I'm 90. <laughs> so I had a person say to me, what do you want to put on your headstone? Yeah. What would, how would you like to be remembered? And I, I tell my wife and kids, I, I wanted to simply say, Mike Ferry made a difference. And, and what do you want that difference to be? Whatever the person wants to accomplish. And Help what is it you want to accomplish? Making the difference in their lives. <laughs> See, it's a question that you can it's wind around. It's just completely circular. It's, it's circular, yeah. Yeah. So you just want to make an impact. And you've yeah. made a huge impact on this on this industry. Thank but you. But that's not slowing you down. No, because there's more to do. And I talked with his wife. You're not going to slow down. No. Like, you, mm. you really love what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And is the love of it just seeing the difference you're making in these agents' lives? They come into you, they're not closing any deals, and they leave, and they start closing a lot of deals? Is that the rewarding part of it? I think the reward comes in the fact that the difference that you and I can make with your show, Mm -hmm. okay, can have can be a lifelong experience for an individual and change their lives, their children's lives, their grandchildren's lives forever if they learn how to do their job, which starts with prospecting. Which is why when I heard about what you were doing, that's why my staff called you so quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, prospect, (laughs) you got Mike Ferry's attention. So you know, my belief has always been that there are certain fundamentals that will never go away, mm-hmm. okay? I kid with people. I say, okay, you you say you want to lose weight. Yeah, I want to lose weight. Okay, if you have a hot fudge sundae, drink a Diet Coke. Maybe it'll counterbalance each other. They go, that's stupid. I say, well, that's the same as not prospecting. Yeah. It's stupid, okay? So it's behavior changers. And, and, I, and I think I've been capable of changing some people's behaviors in a positive manner that is dramatic. Yesterday in this chair, I had five people I interviewed for 20, 30 minutes each that are making millions of dollars that came. One of the ladies, when she started real estate, she was making $17,000 a year. Mm. Okay. And That's this a year, nice living. Yes. <laughs> and this year she'll make a million five. Wow. Just okay. by starting to prospect. All she did was what I said. She, yeah. she said, I met her in 1991. She said, you told me to prospect and I believed you. Mm-hmm. And I prospect three hours a day, every day. She's 71 years old in the prime of her life. She figures she has 15 more years of productivity in front of her. She told us a great story. She said, my first eight years in real estate, I earned a million dollars. The last couple of years, I've earned $6 million and I'm only beginning and I'm 71. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very gratifying. Yeah, that's incredible. And what I've liked in, in just spending the last couple of hours with you is that what you started doing in the 70s, 60s, 70s, you're still doing today. Absolutely. So it shows the relevancy of the system that you have in place that continues to work even though times change significantly. Sure, yeah. And times have changed. Yeah. You know, as that ad said for the cigarettes years ago, these times are a-changing. Well, they're still changing, but what you and I do still is important to making that change work. Yeah. So what do you think when you, there are people I know that are one person in particular that's just in the work your sphere of influence. Yes. Just work your sphere of influence. Absolutely. That's a good portion of it. But you're, I think you're saying that's not all of it. Like prospecting, that's a good part of prospecting. Yes. But there's more than just working your sphere of influence. We have a report online for your viewers if they choose to do it. It's mm-hmm. called 61 Ways to Take a Listing. And it's 61 Methods of Prospecting that I produced. And it took me several months to accumulate from all the different sources I could find, all the methods of prospecting. Then I put a star next to 20 of the 61 that I would recommend they use. And the sphere of influence is in that top 20 by far. Mm -hmm. But it's one. It's one, watch, one, uno, not dos, one. Mm -hmm. 
as you spread out your methods of communication, you spread out your responses and you spread out your opportunities. So we tell every agent, you always have to be involved in five to seven different methods of prospecting. I like that. Yeah, you have to. Because one will work for 30, 60 days and then that doesn't work as well. And maybe the expireds are all selling, so there's no need for that service. Or your centers of influence have all You've drained them of all their leads, so now you have to do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I imagine a lot of you are very familiar with Mike Ferry because you're a legend in this industry, but I don't know how many people realize how global you are. You're not just in America. You're around the world. Yes. So, I mean, you've built this massive operation. Should you ever step away from it? Can it keep going without you? Well, My wife and my staff's dream is that if something were to happen to me, and I hope it does after age 90, um, that the company's system will always be in effect. Colonel Sanders, um, I think he started in his 50s or early 60s and didn't perfect that until he was in his 70s, and that was 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we're trying to create that type of a system, and I think we have that in effect. We operate in Europe. We operate in Russia. We're probably going to be in Germany in the next three or four months. We've got invitations to go into Dubai and into India, to South America, to Australia, South America. I mean, it's it's very demanding time-wise, and it's very exciting. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, So I don't know how big it's going to get, but I don't think what we do will stop if I stop. I think it will continue okay. because it works. Now, I also, I also feel like in my research with you, those you kind of have this following. It almost feels a little cultish because they really are loyal towards you. Yes. How do you get a following like that? I'm loyal to them. Okay. How see, does that work? Well, see, I will tell anybody, if you were starting in real estate or you're an existing agent, Kim, and you decide to take on the Mike Ferry system, I am going to commit my time, my energy, 100% to you. And I do that with, we have thousands, we have 50, 60,000 customers in the US. Uh, We're developing that same thing in Europe and Russia today as we speak. There, I'm available 24 hours a day, seven days a week by phone or email, Mm -hmm. okay, to every customer. Now I tell them, if it's three in the morning, I'm not gonna answer the phone. Mm -hmm. Nor should you. But if you send me a text, the next morning I'll answer it, probably be be four or five o'clock in the morning. So I am devoted and loyal 100% to the clients. And I tell them, I'm not gonna do anything to you that will cause you any harm in the sales field. And you're gonna feel harm when you get rejected and deals fall apart. But I'm committed 100% to your succeeding. And as long as I'm committed to you, I'm gonna ask you for the same commitment in return. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's worked, because these people are very loyal towards you. As I said earlier, we have customers, my longest running customers, also a great friend, Neil Schwartz, And he's been with me for just under 45 years as a client. Wow. And still runs a big company today very successfully. And we still talk every single Monday at 1130, no matter where I am in the world. Wow. That's that's impressive. Well, uh, if you're going to commit to me, I'm going to commit to you. Yeah, I like that. So if there was one message you could give to the industry today, what would that message be? Try prospecting. I mean, that it, no matter what anybody says, It's the answer. I tell a broker, recruiting solves every production and financial problem you could ever experience. Mm -hmm. I tell an agent, prospecting will solve every financial production problem you could ever experience. But under that, learn what to say and learn what to do so you can do it every day. You do it every day, you win the game. Yeah, You can't lose. That's why what you're doing and what you're starting was so important to us. Yeah, well, thank, so thank you. you. No, no, thank you. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, pay attention each week and each month and oh, each day. Thank you very much. To what much. Kimberly's doing. And how do they get a hold of you? I imagine mikeferry.com. Yeah, it's uh, mike.ferry, mikeferry.com. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm so honored you that kidding? you took the time for us. Thank you for being with we us. We loved speaking with you and for this incredible information that all of you just got for free. So oh, thank, thank you. you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Yeah.